Good afternoon. This is Angie Carmen, and I'll be your moderator for today. I'd like to welcome each of you to our PHSSR Research in Progress webinar series, Bridging Health and Healthcare. Our speaker today is Michael Meek, Program Area Director for the Public Health Research Department at NORC at the University of Chicago. His topic will be state and local public health agency responses to ACA implementation. I want to share just a, a little bit of information about our speaker before we start. He serves as, as I said, the program area director in, the, in NORC at the University of Chicago Public Health Research Development and as co-director of the NORC Walsh Center for Rural Health Analysis. Michael is responsible for NORC projects in the areas of rural health public health systems, and emergency preparedness. Recent NORC public health systems and services research projects include studies of public health financing, impacts of the Affordable Care Act on public health programs, analysis of data methods and taxonomies used to assess the public health workforce, evaluation of FAB accreditation program, development of a revised infrastructure classification system for state health departments, and a survey of state and local health departments to assess public health practice-based preparedness research needs. I want to encourage each of you, as Ann has already shared, to put your uh, phone speakers on mute and also to take note of the chat box in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. As you think of questions through Michael's presentation, please put those there and we will address them at the end of the presentation. Uh, Michael, I'll go ahead and turn the program over to you. All right, thank you very much. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is state and local public health agency responses to the Affordable Care Act implementation. Um, and as we get started, uh, I just wanted to give a little bit of background about NORC for individuals who aren't familiar with the organization. Uh, it's an organization with a storied history. It was founded in 1941, uh, and it's a nonprofit research organization with the mission of conducting high-quality social science research in the public interest. Uh, and in terms of public health systems and services research, uh, it, it's an organization that has really placed a strong commitment on PHSSR. Um, this is a list of our past PHSSR projects. It's something we're very proud of, and we have a lot of really great staff who work on these projects. Uh, and then this is, is some of our current projects. We're doing projects focused on accreditation, on workforce, uh, a lot of different areas. The project that I do want to talk to you about today, though, is one uh, that's called the Implications of the Affordable Care Act for HHS Public Health Programs. This is a project that is funded by uh, the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation within the, uh, within the Department of Health and Human Services, the Office of the ASPE. Um, and because of that, I also want to make sure that, that I include this disclaimer, which is that the findings from this project, uh, the conclusions are really uh, my own and do not necessarily represent the views of ASPE or HHS. So just to get started, to provide a little bit of context around this project, I, it really had three main focus areas. Uh, one is to assess the scope of the impact of the Affordable Care Act on state and local public health programs. Uh, a second is to examine how expanded insurance coverage and enhanced benefits may change how individuals seek care and where services are provided. And the third is to examine the potential changes to public health programs as a result of health insurance expansion. Uh, essentially, the, the, the broader context here is that as a result of the Affordable Care Act, a lot of the services that health departments provide uh, are now covered benefits uh, under the Affordable Care Act. This is particularly true for preventive health services programs such as immunization or cancer screening, and that raises questions and, and concerns certainly among the health departments in terms of their future role in providing those kinds of services and, and their role in ensuring that the population has access to those services. And those are the things that I'm going to talk about a little bit more. Uh, this is a slide that really shows how this project was designed to flow. And what I really want to focus on here is the fact that we have a technical advisory group, a TAG. And this is a group that has been very involved throughout the project, uh, really from, from the start, and they continue to be involved throughout the program. Uh, we work with them in an iterative manner where they help us to identify and prioritize 
topics that we explore during site visits. Uh, they suggest states to visit for the site visits. And then once we have conducted those site visits and have analyzed those findings, we bring those back to the technical advisory group to help us with interpretation to make sure that, that they uh, have the proper context uh, for what's going on broadly within the field of public health. And then we use that to refine the process as we do uh, additional site visits. So it really is a, a very nice iterative process. And both of the commentators today actually are members of our technical advisory group, and you'll hear from them later. Uh, the states that we have visited so far, we've gone to five states. Maryland, Tennessee, Arkansas, Iowa, and New Mexico. Um, they are a very diverse set of states uh, in terms of their governance structure um, and also in terms of their expansion status. We have two states that are expanding uh, Medicaid, two that are expanding Medicaid through, uh, through waivers, and one that is not expanding Medicaid. Uh, we also have very good representation regionally by population size, uh, and then we also have uh, states that have some very unique features that we were able to explore through some of these site visits, such as uh, states that have large rural populations, um, states that are highly decentralized like Iowa, um, and states that, that provide a, a, a high number of clinical services like Arkansas and Tennessee. So I want to walk you now through some of the initial case study highlights. Uh, and we've really organized these into a lot of different uh, topic areas. Uh, the first is HHS and state support for public health programs. And as we have met with the states and, and during these site visits, we meet with the state health commissioners, we meet with local health commissioners, uh, we have met with, with the program staff responsible for a lot of different program areas in the health department, and we've also met with Medicaid staff. Uh, as we have talked to individuals at the state level, um, they have expressed concern, uh, all of the states, about ongoing HHS and state support for public health programs, and the additional concern that policymakers may not view traditional public health services as essential. Uh, I think the concern there is that, um, uh, th that, that many policymakers may assume that now that the Affordable Care Act is, is being implemented, that, that takes care of some of the public health roles and functions. Uh, so, so maintaining their own relevance within this, I think, has been a concern. Uh, probably not a surprise. Um, the states that have a higher reliance on state funding feel that they may be in a better position uh, to sustain programs should any federal cuts occur. Um, and I think this last point is probably really the most important here is that Many of the states that we have visited have reported that they are already seeing reductions in the numbers of people served in some of their programs, uh, such as the breast and cervical cancer screening programs and uh, the immunization program. Uh, essentially, individuals, some individuals who now have newly uh, acquired insurance are able to access these services and other uh, through, through health care providers and may not be going to the health department. Um, that's what they're attributing some of those reductions to. So even if funding isn't, isn't reduced at the federal or state level, the service may not be as needed in some of the communities, and that creates some, some challenges uh, in, in the need for planning uh, within the health departments on how to sustain those services for individuals who do continue to need them, but, but, uh, but maintaining those in a way where you're providing the service to a smaller number of people who may be higher need and higher risk. Uh, in terms of billing for services, we hear a lot about billing for public health services. All of the states are expanding their capacity to bill for services, uh, but, but they also recognize that there are a lot of services that public health provides that are never going to be amenable to billing, such as contact tracing or surveillance, um, but, but they still feel that it's important to bill for the services that are amenable. Uh, in three of the states, staff had discussed that the reimbursement levels may not be sufficient to cover health department costs to deliver services, so that even when reimbursement is feasible, it, it may not completely cover the cost of the program. It may not be sufficient to sustain the program by itself. 
In particular, what we heard is that, as I mentioned before, health departments typically provide services to a higher risk and higher need population, and in doing so, cost of providing those services may be more expensive. Um, and as a result, uh, they may not be able to, to uh, access reimbursement levels that, that cover those costs. In addition, they may not have the level of clinical staff um, uh, on, on board to be able to get uh, optimal reimbursement levels. Um, and then finally, in terms of billing for services, we, we've heard a lot from health departments that billing for services changes how health departments do business. Uh, they have to have billing systems in place. They have to have different accounting practices. Uh, they have to train their staff to ask about insurance status, which, which is a heavy lift in some health departments. And they need to hire billing staff. So there are a lot of things that need to be in place for health departments to proceed with billing. And I thought this was, was stated really articulately by one of uh, the stakeholders who we had talked to, where they said that the Department of Health historically didn't need to think about generating revenue and that they're feeling pressure now as a result of the Affordable Care Act. Thinking about funding being cut in the future and more people being insured, they recognize that there's an opportunity that they should be maximizing the billing, and they said that it's changing our mindset and we're becoming more business oriented. That probably has a lot of positive aspects, but it, it also creates some challenges for a public health system. Uh, and then I also wanted to share a little bit of data from NHO's Forces of Change survey. Uh, and I, I think some of the findings from the Forces of Change survey really do uh, provide a, a quantitative perspective on some of these issues that complements some of the qualitative findings that we're seeing. And in terms of billing, you'll see here that 77% of health departments are currently billing and plan to increase their billing. Uh, and an additional 4% who were not billing plan to establish billing. So billing is something that really is becoming more and more common among uh, local health departments and is, uh, is responsible for more and more of the revenues coming into health departments. And then in terms of, of what they bill for, 60% of the local health departments that responded to the survey bill both public and private uh, insurers. Um, and 21% and bill only public insurers. So when health departments are talking about expanding billing, a lot of those are the health departments that are, are billing only one or the other and are planning to expand uh, into both public and private in addition to taking on additional, uh, additional private insurers. Uh, other findings, uh, when we discussed the future role of public health in providing clinical services, uh, we heard that, that even with expansion, health departments may need to continue to serve as a provider for some services, um, and that that need may vary by insurance status, geography. There are certain uh, public health services where there are privacy concerns, like STD testing, uh, where there, there's a rationale to maintain services so that people can access them anom anonymously, and there may be other reasons as well. Um, I think one of the big pieces is that insurance coverage does not equate to access to care, and this is something that was hammered home for us, particularly in the rural communities where individuals are gaining insurance coverage, but there still may not be a sufficient number of providers to, uh, to, to cover this newly insured population, and that may be particularly true with Medicaid recipients. And for that reason, many of the rural local health departments uh, reported that, the, the, um, that, that they feel that they need to sustain these programs so that there's adequate access within their communities. Uh, in addition, some of those rural health departments also talked about how the clinical services help them to maintain capacity to support population health activities. Um, and there was this interesting discussion that we had with many of them where they, they felt that as rural health departments have more opportunity under the Affordable Care Act to provide clinical services, and conversely, many of the non-rural health departments may be able to shift those services to other providers. We end up having almost two public health systems, a rural and a non-rural system, and that may further expand a rural-urban public health divide, which I think is an interesting topic and one where, where there may be some need for future research. Uh, we also heard about secondary impact. So this, this is really, uh, about the concerns that potential budget cuts may negatively impact the health department's ability to maintain 
a workforce and other infrastructure so that they can, can provide sufficient surge capacity and emergency response. So the example that, that, that we heard a lot was uh, if the immunization program is cut and we are able to hi hire fewer public health nurses, then when we have a pandemic flu and we need to do a mass immunization campaign, we don't have the staff on board to do that. So, so there were a number of concerns around secondary impacts. Um, and then I, I think similarly, uh, there was a lot of discussion around sustainability of key public health services. So there are certain activities that, that most health departments felt were really important uh, to sustain for population health, such as immunization, disease surveillance, a lot of screening activities. Uh, and they felt that many of those may not be covered by others in the community. And for some of those providers, really prefer that the health department provide those services as well. So they felt there were additional reasons that it's important for, for public health to sustain those services and were concerned uh, about the, the future viability of some of those services. Um, and then there was a lot of discussion as well about other opportunities for public health agencies. Um, you know, certainly when we talk to uh, individuals in health departments, um, there, there's a lot of anxiety right now because they, they don't know quite what the future holds. It's a, a real changing um, dynamic that they're working in, a changing environment that they're working in. Uh, but it's also important to recognize that there are also opportunities within the Affordable Care Act that public health agencies may be able to pursue. Um, many of the respondents discussed opportunities around billing, which we've already discussed, uh, contracting with providers and health plans, and participation in accountable care organizations or ACOs as some of those opportunities. Um, to date, most of the health departments that we spoke with uh, reported mixed experiences in pursuing some of these opportunities. Uh, I think there is a learning curve for public health in these areas, uh, as well as for the potential partners, the ACOs, the providers. Um, and, and as an example, uh, one of the things that we heard from a health department that was partnering with ACOs was that um, the, the, the core concept, a core concept around the ACO model is shared risk. And there's a perception that the health departments, because they have, have government grant money, they don't have the same level of accountability and risk that other partners do. So how can they be brought into an ACO if they're not assuming the same level of risk? So those are the kinds of things that I think, um, while there are opportunities, there are also uh, some challenges and, and some learning that needs to take place um, to move forward. Um, I included a quote here from one of the, the state health departments um, where, where they have really uh, established some nice partnerships with one of the ACOs, and they said that while the ACO gives kudos to public health, they'll not initiate a contract beyond, um, uh, and there's been no planning on how the program will be sustained beyond grant funding. So trying to move those things to the next level. Uh, in addition, several of the states noted that health departments are not well positioned to take advantage of some of the opportunities. I already alluded to this a little bit, um, where, where public health, health departments provide services to hard to reach and high need populations, and because of that may have higher costs. Um, and because of that, uh, it may be harder for health departments to compete with other providers um, and, and you know, what one of the health departments told us is that the reason they provide some of these services is that others in the community aren't willing to because they're not profitable services. So the health department takes on services uh, that, that others feel are not, um, are not viable in a way that they can make money on. Um, and again, going back to some of the data from the Forces of Change survey, um, I, I think really the first two lines are the ones that are really interesting here as you see this shifting environment uh, that, that public health is working within. Um, Nature found from, from the, the local health department surveyed that, um, that, that the, the area where most health departments were expanding services, this is in uh, population-based primary prevention, and that the area where they were most likely to be reducing services was in immunization. So again, you can see this, this dynamic where, uh, where as people potentially are gaining coverage and have access to these services in other places, 
uh, health departments may be transitioning away from some of those services. I think that uh, the Forces of Change survey was done in 2014, so it was really early in that process, and I think it will be very interesting to see how this uh, continues to progress in the future. Um, and then finally, in terms of the next steps, um, through this project, we, um, we did five case studies in the first year, and ASPE has provided a second year of funding for us to conduct an additional five case studies. Uh, what we want to do in the second year case studies is to make those, um, make those case studies more thematically focused. So we want to explore some of these different themes that were identified in the first year. Uh, and as before, we are going to be engaging with our technical advisory group and consulting with them to help us pr uh, prioritize the thematic areas and to help identify the case study states. Uh, just as an example of some of the, the potential themes, uh, and again, we haven't had a chance to talk to our technical advisory group about these yet, but uh, just as ideas of the potential themes that we may be able to explore through this, it might be things like the integration of public health and health care, contracting with third-party payers, uh, and financing key public health functions or foundational capabilities. And I think that's all I have. Um, and I, I did see that there were a couple of questions that came through as I was presenting. Um, I think Uma already addressed one of them, uh, which was, was what is an ACO, which is an accountable care organization. And again, that's a model um, uh, for, for um, providing coverage uh, under the Affordable Care Act. And, uh, and, and there are opportunities, I think, for health departments to participate under that model. Um, and, then, and then we also had a question about uh, the number of interviews. Um, we met, again, we, we conducted site visits in five states and did uh, approximately um, 10 to 12 interviews in each state um, with, with individuals who were in health department leadership and people who were responsible for different program areas, uh, as well as the state Medicaid directors and representatives from local health departments within those states. Um, and in terms of the topics that were addressed, the domains that were addressed, many of them followed the different themes that I presented here. Um, and I think that's probably it. Um, we, I think we're happy to take a, um, some questions, but, but I know also um, we have the commentary from Dr. Jarris and uh, Dr. Alwalia. Thank you, Michael, for a very informative presentation. We will move to the commentary section uh, of our presentations today, and our first commentator will be Dr. Paul Jarris. Dr. Jarris is the Executive Director of ASTO. So, Dr. Jarris, if you'd like to go ahead and share, and then we'll move to our second commentator, and again, back to questions. Well, thank you very much, and uh, I want to thank ASPE for uh, supporting this very important body of work. Um, and Michael and, and the team at NORC for, for doing the excellent work you're doing. Um, I think it's important to keep in mind that the ACA presents many opportunities as well as challenges. And some of those opportunities, um, clearly it's important that there's increased access to uh, health insurance in this country. That's a positive. Things like the Prevention and Public Health Fund are, are very important sources of funding to continue to support both prevention and public health as we go forward, be part of the, uh, the ACA. The um, triple aim really being established of increased health of the population, decreased per capita costs, and improved patient experience in terms of quality and service is also a really important reformulation of how the health system is oriented. And it provides many opportunities for integration between public health and uh, health care, um, which is a great opportunity for us, uh, although very challenging. Uh, critical among those opportunities are the SIMS grants, the state innovation model grants that are being put out by uh, CMS, uh, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and in particular, um, their innovation center. So there are many opportunities here. Uh, uh, the final one I'll mention, and I won't go on too long on it, is the um, requirement that nonprofit hospitals do community health needs assessment and implementation plans 
to actually look at the population health of the communities they're serving and work to improve it. A great opportunity for health agencies who have to do their own community health needs assessment, community health improvement plan in pursuit of accreditation to uh, align with the hospitals in their communities. The another thing to keep in mind is public health is, is far more than just clinical services. Um, and there's tremendous variation across the country with perhaps the southern states doing more direct service than northern or western states are doing. Um, but we can't forget as we work on integration with healthcare that what the IOM report called for is both integration and differentiation. Uh, public health does different things in clinical medicine as well as in some cases similar things to clinical medicine and we need to preserve those critical unique f factors that public health does. Uh, things such as surveillance, um, uh, health protection, which involves the licensing, many environmental health functions, including the sanitarians doing food inspections and, and outbreak investigations. Public health preparedness is a critical part of public health. So there's so many things we do, I'll throw vital statistics in there, that can't be done by the clinical sector and, and need to be preserved and supported. And we need to be careful that when we look at the impact of the ACA and integration of public health and clinical medicine, we don't make the mistake, um, which I think Michael alluded to, that insurance card can replace public health. It, it simply can't. The areas where um, I think, the, and Michael spent a lot of time on these that, are, um, that are, are perhaps most impacted are those areas where there are clinical services. And to the extent that these are comprehensive primary care services or clinical services, they may be most impacted. Um, and again, those are, there are areas of this country in which public health is the safety net provider. There isn't an FQHC or public health runs the FQHC, so there's nobody else to do it. So the notion, well, why doesn't public health either get out of this business or learn to do it fee for service? Well, um, in some cases they can't get out of the business, nor should they get out of the business. Where they are directly providing comprehensive primary care or services, then public health does need to meet the standards of the, like the clinical sectors, have the full EHR, the fully back, full billing mechanism, and move to our patient-centered uh, primary care. Um, that's a complex transition. Many parts of the country have done it, but many have not. It takes planning, it takes investment, um, and it takes time to move from basically a grant-supported program into a fee-for-service environment. Um, the more commonly public health does, if you will, the wraparound services, uh, some of the children with special health care needs, the care management, uh, some of the breast and cervical cancer work where we're doing, doing navigation and care management, um, contact tracing if there's an infectious disease outbreak. And those are more challenging and don't fit into a fee-for-service model. Um, there's two thoughts about that I want to deliver. One is we should be careful. Medicine as a whole and healthcare as a whole is trying to move away from fee-for-service toward value-based purchasing other things such as capitation, per capita payments. And so at the same time, the notion that we're going to move public health into fee-for-service as healthcare is moving out of fee-for-service is at least conceptually problematic. So we should remember that some of these public health programs, family planning um, or breast and cervical cancer, the grant could be perceived as a per capita payment, as a capitation, if you will which, based on the population, which tends to drive innovation, such as nurse-based cl uh, protocol clinics, as opposed to more expensive providers in a comprehensive setting. So we shouldn't take it for granted that necessarily we should move to fee-for-service from a capitated grant payment. I think we have to keep that notion out there and explore it more. Um, the, um, so the question of how we work with healthcare, we need to. There's no question about it. And some health departments have been successful at negotiating case rates, um, such as uh, you know for children with special health needs. I think in Michael, one of your reports in New Mexico, they're they're given a fee for 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 a kid that's enrolled, very consistent with a case rate payment that's used in the insurance world. So there's lots of opportunities. There are a lot of challenges, but it's that's my timer. I'll stop in a second. Um, but the critical thing is it's going to take planning and it's going to take investment and we're going to have to do our work differently in the future than we do it today. So Michael, last thing I'll say is, uh, and this is a specific thing, with regard to looking at the forces of change uh, survey from NACHO, and you said that was 2014 data and that survey has been done over a number of years. ACA implementation is only one factor and I think probably a far greater factor in the reduction in services is the economy, where public health agencies 
um, and at state and local level have lost over 50,000 employees in the last several years. And so programs have been cut back probably largely and mostly because of decreases in, in, in the state and local budgets and the funding of public health, and less so in the ACA, which is just now being implemented. So I'll stop at that point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Jarris. We appreciate those comments. And we'll move to our next commentator for today, which is Uma Aluwalia, who is currently the director of the Montgomery County Department of Health and Human Services in Maryland. So Uma, I'll turn the program over to you. Great. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I, I too want to say thank you to Ashley and to North for this amazing um, work that's been happening and that there's phase two ahead of us, so that's exciting. Um, I just have to give you a little bit of context. Montgomery County is an in human services department. So um, the ACA sort of provided the impetus that we needed to continue to push the integration of public health with not just um, primary care, but also behavioral health and social services. Well, we're finding families who are walking in our door, the patients who are walking in our door rarely have one issue. They're not just coming in for an immunization shot. There are lots of other things going on, like domestic violence and homelessness. And, and so that integration and the impetus that comes with the integrated eligibility, the express uh, lane, uh, all of that, which is for me, yeah, yeah. it's been tremendously impactful in pushing us to the um, see the electronic health director, health insurance, the health information exchange, and billing, and yeah. all these things that are logical. Opportunity, trying to, but it also creates some tremendous pressures, right? Before we used to do this, um, this is just a system of either okay or actually the community programs that both the services were different. Um, we're trying to bring some consistency now that we're applying an electronic health record across the to the safety network, the public health agency, um, the system, how do we make sure that the data is flowing, and here's where the role of the health information exchange is so powerful, and tracking their hospitalization, their offices, and back again, uh, and their lab work, their pharmacy, and their um, radiology. So really trying to from all of this, figure out how the data flows, how to look at interesting um, small change of October. Um, for example, really uh, eligible the Medicaid Medicaid population living in public housing where typically there is a health care services um, and the cost as well to bring those costs how to bring them there is sort of cover the public private looking at global payments and capitated health care costs as opposed to their costs, which was how the prior waiver um, was established. There's a lot of risk, but also tremendous opportunity for shared work. Um, it's also a stage for um, an app, imperative to see confidentiality sharing, privacy and sharing, um, especially when you have the patient of health, um, not um, Uma, Uma, can you hear me? Uma, can you hear me? Yes. This is Nan Kelly. I can. Unfortunately, we are not getting good audio from your remarks. Only a couple of words are coming through. So. It may be best if we provide those in a written statement after the fact, um, because we're losing the train of your discussion, unfortunately. I don't know if you can make any other adjustments um, there, but it's not working. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> Try it again. <laughs> All right. I, I don't know where you lost me. I am so sorry. I was just talking about confidentiality and privacy and the need to figure out um, the information sharing frame. Um, 
I think um, Dr. Jarvis was, Jarvis was right. The reduced funding is not all the result of the ACA, but regardless, there's been reduced funding. Yep. The vulnerable population is part of the task in front of us. Um, accreditation is extremely important at local public health level. Um, demographic shift, we have really seen a huge shift in our population uh, from historically underserved to new emerging immigrant populations that are really challenging us from a language perspective, an access perspective, and an equity of outcomes perspective. Um, triple AIM, we're working on triple AIM. And uh, lastly, I would say that we have to sort of together figure out what's the collective impact to improve the health and well-being of our population. So I don't know how much of that you lost. I apologize. I'm calling in from India. Um, so hopefully, if not, I can put them in writing too. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Uma. And we, we are sorry that we couldn't make the connection clear up a, a little sooner, but we certainly do appreciate uh, your effort in calling in uh, from India for us today. Uh, we have received a couple of questions in the chat box, so we'll move to those. And Michael, I think the first couple are directed uh, to you. Uh, we have a question from Glenn Mays that says, with your qualitative methodology, are you able to get a sense of within state differences in the experience regarding, for example, rural versus urban settings? Yeah, and, and it's a great question. And uh, that's probably one of the things we heard the most. Is, is there are a lot of within state differences, uh, I think, in all of the states we talk to. Um, and a lot of those do seem to vary by geography, by, by rural versus urban. Um, and a lot of that, I think, goes back to the issue of, uh, of the clinical preventive services, the need to retain those services because uh, there may not be sufficient uh, provider coverage to, to, to ensure those services otherwise. Um, we, we did meet with both rural and urban local health departments um, and saw uh, a lot of that difference. In addition, when we were in New Mexico, uh, there were differences um, between the, the health departments that were more along the border region uh, as compared to other areas within the state. Um, so yeah, I, I think you see a lot of that. Thank you. We have another question that uh, regarding the billing services. A lot of health departments use billing services because it, because it is not cost effective for them to set up internal billing capacity. Did you run into this phenomenon and do you have any insight? Uh, I, I think we might have heard a little bit about that, but, but not much. Um, so I, I'm not sure we have a lot of great insights. I know that uh, Dr. Jarris had, had responded to that as well. Um, you know, the, the, the issues we heard more were uh, some of the challenges in the initial development of the billing system or the initial uh, implementation of the billing system and both, both the strategies to overcome that as well as, as again, some of the challenges uh, in, in making that happen within the communities. So this is uh, Paul. Um, you know, I, I, I spent over 20 years in the clinical sector running medical groups and um, particularly uh, in the initial phases or as the system's being set up, the billing services can be very helpful. Um, if you're dealing with multiple insurers, they can scrub the claim to make sure uh, electronically to make sure it's consistent with what that uh, insurance company requires, which is a very difficult thing to do manually in-house. Um, so that it tends to be a very good way to go um, unless you're a very large organization with lots of billing and can support a whole billing staff. The thing we, there's a couple things to keep in mind. One is billing is not the issue. It's collection that's the issue. You actually want the money in the door. And that is a whole different thing than just being able to quote bill. Um, so we need to get much more sort of sophisticated and granular when we're looking at what do we mean by billing systems. There are also, uh, and it's not simply just coding a visit and mailing it and getting a check back. There's all the issues around you have to contract. You have to make sure the providers are credentialed on a regular basis and every insurer may have a different time, timing of that. Then you have to set up certainly the billing systems, the encounter sheets, 
training providers to bill is extremely difficult. It's a very complex uh, system to actually know the appropriate billing. And then you get into the billing system where you scrub it, submit it, get it back with a rejection, re-scrub it, submit it again, and, and chase your money. So what we actually need to be looking at is what is our collection rate and what is our days to collection. Um, so much more sophisticated than we've ever had before. And we can't overestimate the complexity uh, the human aspect of this to get people in public health, and I used to work in a nonprofit um, health clinic, uh, it was the same issue. People are there to help people. It is very uncomfortable to train them to ask how will you be paying today and actually collect. So the human side of this is complex also. Yeah, and I, I think those are really, really good points. Um, the, the other pieces that we heard a lot are um, that, that, that uh, billing changes the, the accounting practices that the health department needs to use. Uh, instead of having a lump sum grant and charging against the grant, they need to be um, uh, reconciling revenues against costs, which, which is different from how public health has, has done that in the past. Um, I agree 100 percent that, that it's all about the collection. Uh, the other piece that we heard a lot, and this was an interesting uh, component based on the state public health structure. Uh, the thing that we heard a lot was was around the negotiating contracts with the third-party payers, and that was considerably easier in centralized states because the state was doing the negotiation on behalf of all of the local units within the state, uh, and it's it was more challenging in states with a decentralized structure where each of the local health departments had to do a lot of that negotiation on their own, and many of the local health departments uh, were, were uh, they talked about uh, the benefits of having the state do that on their behalf and, and exploring that with the state. So one other and, challenge. And this is in my, I, go ahead. Sorry. Right on. Right no, on. no, no, sorry. I was just going to add to that one point, if people can hear me. Um, one of the biggest challenges, I think, in negotiating contracts with managed care organizations and third party is often the liability section of the contract and getting the county attorney and the managed care entity to actually agree to terms and conditions. And we're finding in Maryland the state was actually negotiating with the MCO and even with that, often counties have their own liability requirements overlaid on top of what the state does. So all of the things that um, Paul spoke about, Michael spoke about, all of those are relevant, but on top of that are these very cumbersome contractual issues that sometimes really stymie the clinical side of the practice and need, need fair amount of uh, care and feeding. One of the other issues that comes up is that uh, at least in a number of public health programs or nurse-based programs, and in which if you bill for Medicaid for a nurse-based visit on a fee-for-service basis, you may not, your reimbursement may not, may not even cover the cost of your billing. Um, and so it may require a transition to a nurse practitioner physician model, um, which again gets back to the whole notion of is moving in fee-for-service the right direction when you have a capitated grant-based model. But We do have one more question that has come in in the chat box. With the providers who prefer that local health departments continue to provide services rather than building their own capacity, what types of services and were these providers more likely to be in rural or non-rural areas? Mm -hmm. It's a good question. Um, typically we heard this from the program staff at the state health department, so I'm not sure that I, I can address the second part in terms of whether they were more likely to be rural or non-rural, although uh, I, I would guess that, that in many instances it would be more likely to be in rural just because of uh, the lack of providers in many rural communities. Um, however, I think the service that we heard this uh, about most was immunization, where, uh, where what we were told is that, that providers um, don't want to, to take on the risk of uh, purchasing and storing immunization, um, you know, if the refrigeration goes out, they lose it. Um, if, uh, you know, if it expires, it's lost revenue, um, and, and there's not a lot of money to be made on immunization. So 
uh, that's one of those services that they would just assume the health department provide, all things being equal. I think that's probably the most common example, although I, I do think we heard, uh, heard this as well for, for some other services like STD testing and, and some others as well. Are there additional questions, either through the chat box or the phone lines are certainly open for those now? So, so Glenn just asked a question about uh, differences in experiences found in expansion versus non-expansion states. Um, for our study, so far we have only visited one non-expansion state, so it's, it's a pretty limited sample. Um, what was really interesting about that to me, though, is that what they, what they said is that they are still going through the same issues that because many people are gaining uh, insurance through the marketplace, uh, they still have the same concerns about volume decreasing within the health departments and what that means for the services they're providing. Uh, the degree may be somewhat different, but, but the issue that they're facing is very much the same. Any other questions? Michael, I would like to just ask you one question that's sort of a workforce um, issue. When, when you shared the quote with, from the one individual who said that public health is doing business differently now and becoming more business oriented, do you have any insights about the implication on staffing that that situation provides, especially with regard to leadership at the health department level? Um, well, you know, I, I, I think Dr. Jarris alluded to that as well, where um, there are a lot of uh, training implications, uh, particularly around billing, and, and I think that quote really was um, framed around the billing question, uh, where, where, you know, as, as people who are trained in public health, often, you know, they, they, I, I think it is uncomfortable for them to ask about insurance status and to be, uh, asking people to pay for service. Um, so it's just a, a bit of a cultural change, and I think it is a, uh, a training issue that goes with that. Uh, ultimately, I think you're right. I think it's a leadership issue, and uh, that um, it's going to need to come from the leadership within any given health department to make sure that the staff are trained and comfortable in moving forward in that way, because it is a lot different. Than, uh, than people have been trained in the past and, and that uh, public health has operated in the past. Did you no, I think see it's, any, I'm sorry, go ahead, Dr. Jarrett. Sure, um, I went through a transition with a, a medical group that had been a uh, um, salaried medical group working in a capitated system um, in which we regularly had meetings about quality improvement, case uh, meetings about patients and how to control them and the better and credit diabetes and a lot of QI, and we went through a transition uh, where our eyes are basically pulled out uh, of the area we're working, and we had to build a fee-for-service and go into a fee-for-service private practice. We no longer had those meetings about quality improvement, about diabetics, Medicaid. We, what we had meetings after that on was our billing systems. How do we put a roof on the building? How do we pave the driveway? The, the I, I will say, you know, the, the rigors of running a fee-for-service business uh, change the culture dramatically um, in an organization um, be, just because of the discipline and the demands about having to make that bottom line. So I, I think that's something to be aware of. I mean, we can't stop what's happening, but it is something to be aware of. Um, and, and if we can try to remember to try to protect that time for the public health to do the population health. I, I have met with several states uh, in which some of the their local health departments, whether they're centralized states or decentralized, are running FQHCs. And um, they indicated that many of the staff within those settings essentially become clinical staff and, no, and lose the identity of a, a party responsible for the population health. So it's a, it, it's a real challenge, and, it, and it's something that we'll have to, how do we preserve population health? when we go into a system of fee-for-service which and the rigors of having to run a fee-for-service business. Mm -hmm. We have another comment from Glenn that's come in. Dr. Jarris' comment about movement away from fee-for-service is important for value-based payment. Is public health ready to collect and report accountability metrics in lieu of a bill for services? 
this is a, a very important uh, question that's being asked, and it is an important transition we're going to have to make. Um, I, I, as I mentioned before, had worked for Kaiser and a predecessor before, a nonprofit uh, HMO. And when we contracted with vendors um, to do care management, case management, um, they had to provide us incredible statistics on the number of people they saw, what the outcomes were. And we put them at full risk to achieve the results they said they were going to result, achieve. So if they didn't achieve the results, they weren't paid. I got a call from one of the states who was trying to negotiate with their Medicaid managed care um, and asked the state, well, what kind of statistics can you provide on this program? What kind of process, outcome, numbers, what have you achieved? And they said, well, we really never collected that information. So um, this question, is, a, uh, is that Glenn's question? I should have known that, huh? Yeah. Um, it's a very important question, and that is a very important transition uh, we're going to have to make. This is Uma. I don't know that we have a choice. I right. think we ha it's sort of inevitable that we have to move in this direction. We have to become more data savvy, look at metrics, um, do the analytics in order to know whether we are getting a return on an investment, whether that's, it's not just the billing, right? The revenue is important, but it is really, ultimately it's imp improving the health of the population. Otherwise, why is public health involved? And so continuously having that, that an alignment discussion within public health and with our safety net partners, I think is really critical. Mm -hmm. It's Other back questions? to the integration and differentiation. What is public health's unique and distinct competence here? The discussion of metrics, me measurements, and, and quality improvement that Dr. Jarris mentioned, does that also uh, not ripple over into staffing in a way, from a skill set perspective, in a way that might be in addition to what we spoke about earlier with the billing systems? Will we be looking for different types of staff, different skill sets in the future? Yeah, you know, I, I think we will. Um, I, I think this also goes to Dr. Jarris's point, though, that, that as we move into these new areas, we need to be careful not to lose the population health focus uh, of public health. And I, I think one of the challenges that, that strikes me in, in that regard is that the things that are funded in public health tend to be um, more, more of the, the tangible sorts of things that, you know, tangible to policymakers in terms of the clinical preventive services or, or, or direct uh, services provided to, to clients or patients. Um, and I don't know that we have a lot of the funding lines for some of the population-based services that we need to sustain. And I think that that's ultimately a risk for public health is that as we move into uh, trying to recoup funds or sustain funds for, for a lot of these programs, um, to the extent that we need to move into these other areas, we have to ask the question on how are those new areas going to be funded? I also think I just want to add one. Uma, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, no, the only thing I was going to say was is we implemented our electronic health record, and this was a very on-the-ground experience that we had. After about three to four months of implementation, we started getting all these amazing reports, right? But we weren't used to managing with any of this data. And so the data comes in and the data is showing that there's a very high no-show rate in our clinics, um, and it, which says that productivity is really harmed because we're not doing a good job of making sure that the patients are actually showing up at the clinics. We go back to the providers with that data, and immediately the response is that that data is not right. Well, at what point are we holding ourselves accountable to the data that's in the system and actually managing with the data and then starting to hold the providers accountable to say if you're having a no-show rate and if you're not doing the appropriate follow-up um, and this is the threshold that's accessible, et cetera, et cetera, then having that data is kind of meaningless, right? And then our clinic will never become more productive and the revenue generation will be heard, which then may hurt our ability to subsidize in those areas of practice where funding is diminishing. 
So it's all sort of related, and to build that capacity and that comp and so you do need a different workforce, but you also need to bring your existing workforce along, and that's quite a big challenge, I think, as we're going forward. We found when, when uh, it was part of that whole era when physician practices were joining larger systems, and we brought a number, because we were a staff model, a number of private practices into our salaried system and found on average productivity for providers fell about 25% when we moved them into a salaried situation. So uh, now we, over the years, learned how to deal and cope with that, but um, that whole issue of managing the performance of providers is very important. But critical to that, you don't only want to manage their productivity. You want to manage their quality, you want to manage their service, um, and yeah. you want to manage their utilization of resources. Um, Thank you for I the think, question. Yeah, one of the things I think that this also reinforces is the need to look at our enterprise, our federal, state, and local enterprise, and how do we best work together. And I know Pat Libby through, uh, has been doing quite a lot of work with the Kansas, Kansas Health Foundation on shared services. Scale really makes a difference in a lot of this stuff. And we heard the comment before about in, in negotiating with insurance companies or buying billing systems or electronic health records. and so really looking at those shared services and looking at the local state federal partnership is going to be very important as we go forward. We're actually almost at the end of our time today, but I would like to leave the lines open for just another question or maybe two. Is there anything else we can address today? Well, hearing none, I will um, share with you the future webinars on your screen. You can see that our next uh, Research in Progress webinar will be Wednesday, January 14th from 12 to 1 Eastern Time, and our topic will be Local Public Health Clinic Retraction and Reproductive Health Services Utilization and Outcomes. Our speaker will be Nathan Hale from the Arnold School of Public Health at the University of South Carolina. So we would like to thank each of you for attending today and certainly thank our speaker, Michael, and both of our commentators today for sharing your insights. It was a, a very informative presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.